My name is Dr. Norman Nassis. Um Actually, I'm a physician. I'm a OBGYN, but primarily a pelvic reconstructive surgeon. Uh, I've retired after 37 years in practice. I did my residency in, at UCSF, and uh, I didn't like San Francisco all that much because it had a terrible sky, even back then. Uh, so I decided um, to go to a little small town that was uh, trying to get me to come, Red Bluff, California. Uh, they made an offer I couldn't refuse, and they had a great sky, so it was a no-brainer. Uh, so that's why I left. I went there. Uh, but I went to the College of San Mateo here. I loved it. I met Mike at the time. Uh, didn't know him very well. He was here, he was an upperclassman. He was a year ahead of me, so he didn't talk to me very much. Uh, so anyway, so I'm going to go through a bunch of slides. And the other thing I'm going to do is this. If it's time for me to kind of quiet down, just kind of nod off or fall asleep, and I'll get the idea <laughs> that it's ending. I don't know what time you end, but I could probably talk for the next three days because I'm into this subject and I love it. Uh, but you'll let me know. And I want to make sure I take questions at the end, OK, because I want to answer some. OK, so my main theme tonight really is, is the use of the mobile observatory as an outreach instrument. I can talk too much. Okay. Uh, and what I want to do is I don't want to get involved too much with my home observatory and the physical observatories. Uh, it's mostly the mobile observatories I want to talk about. And the reason I love what I do is because I've done it ever since I was a little kid. And I was inspired as a little kid to do many little things, and I loved everything. And so I'm kind of still on fire, even at 72, whatever I am, 72. Um, but anyway, I'm going to go through this. And I wouldn't mind taking questions if anyone raises their hand during the presentation, be my guest. Uh, so I'm going to go through plenty of time. So what time would you like me to stop in general? What time is the stopping time so people don't have to feel embarrassed to leave? Uh, is there any set time? 10 minutes the hour and then you can take your next 10 minutes before okay perfect all right i got it okay so uh the name of our entity our organization is star chasers um i took this picture i wrote this little thing uh i'm not trying to give a religious connotation to it necessarily but i this is kind of the way i feel about the universe and its complexity and its beauty and its miraculousness uh, so it's not meant to offend anybody religiously or otherwise. It's just the way I feel, how passionate I feel about the universe. Uh, this is Laura and I on one of our star chasing ventures. I'm not sure where it was necessarily, but we've been pretty much all over the place, particularly in the West Coast. Um, and so we go from place to place and we do all these different kinds of shows and little seminars and stuff. Uh, okay. And this is our mission statement. Uh, we can all read it, but I'll basically uh, is to promote public awareness, education, appreciation, preservation, one of our most precious and often overlooked natural resources, the night sky. So I consider myself a conservationist, but my emphasis is not the grass, the trees and whatever, although I love all that stuff, is the dark sky. Uh, and our main goal is to inspire youth. That's really, my, my real emphasis is youth, uh, to become astronomers and scientists, uh, because they're going to determine the future of our planet. And they're our future. And the way things are going, we need, a, <laughs> we need some people down here that are stewards of the universe and of the sky. And so that's why I want to focus on them. All right, uh, origins, OK? Uh, because of the deterioration of our local dark sky and me complaining so much about it, my wife, Laura, actually had the brilliant idea of coming up with a mobile observatory. It wasn't my idea, although I wish it was. Uh, and I can't say it was because she's here this evening. Uh, so basically, she said, she saw a U an SUV, and she said, why don't you go ahead and put a telescope in it? And we can travel all around the dark sky national parks, go to schools and colleges, and host star parties. And hence, in 2005, Star Chasers was born. 
Okay, so she had this great idea. I love to build stuff. I'm kind of engineering or mechanically inclined. So I said, I can do this. So what I did is I built the mount, built the telescope, not the telescope, modified the telescope, modified the vehicle. Uh, uh, and then what we did is we went to uh, the Riverside Astronomical or Amateur Telescope Making Astronomy Conference and whatever. They loved it. It was unique. We got a great attendance. And even Sky and Telescope liked it and they put it in the magazine. So we were, you know, we, we didn't expect anything, but we were quite pleased. Okay, and this is the uh, Sky and Telescope version. And this is their ad. So this is us here in that, obviously. Uh, now we've made several modifications in, what's the matter? Oh so, <laughs> several modifications and improvements of the telescope in the vehicle over the last, what is it, 15 years or so? Yeah. Um, all right, and I'll go over some of those in the next slides. So there, it's her and I, I think this is at Sequoia National Park, I believe. Right? Yeah, and explain the telescope a little bit since that's a great picture. Can I kind of explain Say it again? Car, explain the car a little bit, maybe? Uh, okay, yeah, you know, kind of I, I will. Um, so basically what it is, I'd modified it. This had a 14-inch mead at one time. Eh, it was great at the time. The technology was as good as Celestron and others. However, with time, eh, it kind of become obsolete. So I changed it up. It has, it's entirely different inside the telescope, the cameras, everything is pretty much different. Now, so uh, what the idea that Laura had is that, look, the telescope come, comes up, which is beautiful because it just fits inside. So what the automobile has of the SUV is that it has a very nice retractable roof, which would be hard to make, and it closes and shuts perfectly. The telescope just fits in perfectly. So what I did is I made the lift to take the telescope in and out. And also I modified the vehicle so it would have jacks in the front and in the back. So therefore it would be level. And it would basically take the vehicle off, the tires or off the ground, except for basically forming a tripod, essentially. So it's very stable and you'd have to push the car to make it move. And, 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 and it really wouldn't matter that much because of the optics and the settings are so fast, even if you've shoved a little bit <laughs> within a few seconds, it would be gone. Um, so that's the vehicle. Any questions about the vehicle? Probably not. Yeah? Yeah, you're saying that you modified the optical system. So that's normally an F10, right? Well, no, and I'm gonna get into all that. Okay. So what I'm gonna do is go into uh, real detail on the optical system. Okay, cool. But the vehicle, mm, pretty much the same. Okay. The lift's the same. It's a different telescope, different software, and all that. But I'm, I have that broken down. And thank you for asking that. I will bring that up. Oh, okay, here it is. Sandy asked the question. <laughs> okay, so it used to be a 14 meet. Eh, it had its issues. So basically, the top optical tube assembly has been modified from its native 10, F10. Uh, configure, which is slow, small field of view. I guess I'll read it from this way. Uh, small field of view to an F2, which everyone, I think most people know here, is fast, large field of view. And to do that, I took the secondary mirror out of the director plate, put a hyperstar lens, hyperstar, Arizona hyperstar, they make an F2 reducer, very, I think it's pretty famous. And um, that changes it from an F10 to an F2. Don't look through the back of it. There's no cameras in the back. All the cameras and everything are in the front. So it sits out the corrector plate. Uh, and it makes it, it makes it amazingly fast. Um, in a way, it's so fast that you don't even need a drive. Because my seconds and pictures are being taken on a video camera, I'll get to that. So it takes me about three minutes to integrate an image because there's a lot of light coming in and it's fast and it's a large field of view. All right, so, so the F2 configuration being faster um, and having a large field of view is perfect for viewing the galaxies and nebulas. It is not especially good for viewing planets of the moon because they, they're that big. Uh, and you don't get much magnification at F2. 
Uh, however, uh, those are better seen with a higher F number, like the native F10. They're great for that. But for galaxies and stuff, not so much. Now, because of that, and because all these little kids and a lot of people want to look through a telescope, so what I did is I designed a mobile <laughs> eight inch telescope that I could roll around and it would adjust for kids and adults. Because I felt bad one day, I was up at a place and this little boy had a broken leg and he couldn't look at it. So I put the telescope on a table and I said, that's kind of a bummer. And then a lot of older people have a hard time looking through the telescope and a lot of taller people can't do it. So I made it so it would fit their height. And that was cool, and I liked that. And it was something I could figure out how to do, and I love those kinds of issues and problems to solve. <clears throat> okay, now, the reason I love the new Celestron that I have is this. Um, it has CPW telescope control and imaging software. Now, what's really cool is I have at home a bigger telescope, a plain wave 14 inch Schmidt Cassegrain telescope with all this junk on it and I have a plane wave equatorial mount, and it's awesome. It's a motor, I'm sorry, um, uh, mm -hmm. magnet-driven motor, no noise, no periodic error, nothing. Fast, quick, beautiful, and the software is awesome. Uh, and you can, once you just, once you get it aligned the first time, once only, it has this, I think I'm going uh, in front of myself. Um, but what the software does is that like some softwares, like what his telescope he showed me today. What's the name of it? An EV scope. Yeah. yeah so what it has is that if you point it, it has, in my case, I have a star sense camera on it. So it senses what's up there. It sees what's up there. It compares it to a bunch of different uh, photographs or data sets. And it, from that, it can find it, where it is. Before, you'd have to triangulate. You'd have to go to this vega and then over here and this and that. And you'd hear during shows a lot of a lot of crickets. So that got really frustrating. So what we did is we made that kind of uh, recognition software. It made it so much easier. Within a minute, we could set it up, which is cool. Particularly if you're traveling to different parts. If you're at home in the uh, permanent observatory that I have, it's easy. It's already set. You just turn it on and you're there. But when you're traveling all over the place, that's not the case. Okay, so now the other thing is, and this kind of come up later on in this. The telescope and everything can be controlled over the internet, which is nice. So I have a 10 megabyte speed up and down, and it's very fast. So I have it where that uh, if I'm not at my house, unless I'm somewhere else and I want to do a show, one of my companions that we'll see here can actually run it from his house on a microwave dish to mine onto the computer and run the telescope and do this imaging. So I can sit up and have the fun and just do a lot of chatting. So it's really cool because what I did with that, and I'll show you later on, I put it on a website so it's free for anybody. So if you wanted to go out there or you did or someone that didn't, that had a telescope and that wanted to broadcast on a worldwide internet, we could do it for free. So uh, that's one of the things. And I'll talk about that a little later in the case. <laughs> In the case, uh, it's not a medical case, in the uh, <laughs> presentation. All right. So that the star design camera, or that star sense digital, basically takes a few pictures, analyzes pictures against the internal database, similar to fingerprint matching, and automatically aligns the telescope. And again, it takes about three minutes. Uh, and there's no user involvement, which is nice. You just put the button on, and it does its thing, and it finds where it is, and it goes from perfectly from spot to spot, or star to star. Now this is a, a new, these are all fairly new additions, or at least up to tech, because back in 2005, I had none of this stuff, and it wasn't nearly as cool, I didn't think. <laughs> what? It was bad. It was bad? In 2005. Oh, 2005 was bad. A lot of crickets back then. <laughs> uh, and then what we do is we use a Malincam DS26 air-cooled digital video camera. High-end, beautiful, uh, quality images, great company. If you have any issues, they, they fix it, which is really hard to get these days. Um, and it has very sophisticated, cool applications that you can use it for. And then most recently, even in Red Bluff, um, we've had 
industries come in, Home Depot, stuff like that. And, and even where I lived, which was absolutely black, you could see the Milky Way hanging out. It's deteriorated over the years. So the way that I fix that is to use a narrow band filters. They just cut out all the ambient light. I, I mean, when I first looked through it or looked at the screen and compared it to images I took before I had the narrow band filter, it was like night and day. It was almost like, why go out to a dark sky when I can almost do it in a polluted sky? And, there, and having said that, what I'm really saying is this. Even in kind of a very polluted area like this, this light pollution is horrific here. I mean, I remember when I came to San Mateo, I could see a few stars and maybe a little bit, but now it's nothing. So the good thing about this apparatus is that even in skies like this, you can see great images. Now, why is that important for me? And I think it should be for people that do outreach in astronomy is you can take the telescope into a place where kids, or I say kids all the time, youth, they have no clue what they're looking at. If they can see a sky, the star or the moon or whatever, they feel lucky. But if you can show in the same sky, a galaxy or a nebula, it really is a, a jaw kind of opener. So they, they love it. And the other thing about youth, and the reason I want to appeal to them, they're very geeky, I'm not geeky, tech savvy. And if they can play with an instrument and run the telescope remotely or make it and drive it, which I let them do sometimes, they love it. So it kind of stimulates them to want to play with this thing or want to do it. So that's why I think appealing to the younger kids, the younger generation is awesome because I think they've lost some of that. When I was growing up, I could see the stars, I could see the moon, I could see all this stuff. Galaxies, maybe a little bit, but now it's different. Okay. Uh, this, I just happened to show this one. This is just in my backyard. Now, as being a physician, I have access to a lot of junk they want to throw away at the hospital, and I'm there to grab it. So this is the bottom of a power wheelchair. Oh, I'll show this. I have a pointer here, That's even better. Okay, so this at the bottom is a power wheelchair, okay? This here is a linear actuator off of a hospital ER, OR bed. Uh, and I can go up a delta of maybe 15, 18 inches. So I can get it really low and really pretty high. That way no one has to bend over the eyepiece or anything. And it's kind of a fun thing to roll it around because the kid goes, oh my God, what's the telescope moving? Yes, it is. Is it very stable? Yes, it is, because that thing weighs a ton with all the batteries in it. So in the back of my, S my SUV or my Envoy Mobile Observatory, I roll it up a ramp, take it with us. So if people want to look through an eyepiece, I got one. If they want to see the moon, the stars, um, and the planets, there it is. So that gives them a way to actually physically pull the eyepiece and look at things without thinking it's coming over through a, a, a magic computer screen or something. Uh, so that's kind of a, a more personal touch. A lot of the kids like that. They want to see the moon. They see the moon. They're wow. They love it. There, there's a, my my grandson looking through it. Just we we just finished it up, so he's trying to see if he can make his eye level down and move it around. So that's basically what it is. So he can hold it in his hand and do all the adjustments. That thing right. Oh, that thing right there is where I can move it and turn it and roll it around. So it's kind of cool. It's heavy otherwise, but with, with it being able to be moved so easily, it's easy to do. Okay, now, even my area in Red Bluff, it's not as black as it used to be, not as dark, not as nice as it was, and it's disappointing. And that was actually one of the reasons I built the mobile observatory. However, I also have a, a permanent observatory at that location. Now, during one of my uh, trips to Lassen Park, one of the rangers said, hey, uh, could you come to Hat Creek uh, Observatory? I'm sorry, not Hat Creek, no, that's up the road. Dye Creek and give a little presentation or whatever. And he loved it and he said, look, uh, we have this big area, would you bring it out to our place? And I said, I think what I'll do is I'll build you a mobile observatory out there. Because what I wanted also is I wanted to be able to run the telescope from home and have the black sky because it's a, 
it's a dark sky designated area. I think it's about 40,000 acres, but I have a slide on it, I think. So I can go in my house, run the telescope from the house and look at the images in my room and it's pitch black out there. So the images are awesome. Yeah. So it was kind of selfish in a little bit, but yeah, they like it and I like it. So it worked for both of us. Um, and Scott Hartridge is another member. He's, he's part of what we do. And he's, uh, in, he's in charge of that uh, observatory at that place. Again, 40,000 40, unfragmented acres of land. I mean, it is awesome. It's, it is uh, no mountains, it's just horizon to horizon. So that's really cool. Um, now, the, that mobile observatory has the exact identical features of the Envoy Mobile Observatory. They're both about the same age upgraded wise. And that way, no matter where we are or what observatory it is, even the home, the mobiles or whatever, they can all be run with the same software from a remote location. So having said that, I've even talked to uh, one of the hotels in Hawaii, where we go sometimes. And I said, hey, I can present a sky show on your roof and help you guys out because they have a small telescope and we can project it up there from a location in Red Bluff and have it real time. So we've been thinking about that. Now this is the mobile observatory I built for the one at the Dye Creek Observatory. Uh, there's a telescope coming through the roof, shoots up through the roof, and there's the telescope here. And this is the lift I built for this particular model, this design. And the reason, oops, here we go. Thank you, Laura. So the reason I built it this way is I want to be able to not freeze to death in the winter and be outside and taking pictures. And what I do, you don't want to jump up in the, in the, in the car and have all the telescopes jumbling around. So I made it so that it's like kind of a lunar lander kind of thing, where the, the, the actuator, the feet come down to the ground, and then from there, it lifts the base all the way up through the roof. And it's isolated, so it doesn't touch the, touch the frame. So you can walk around, have coffee, watch the, on the monitor, and, and the telescope is stationary, which is kind of cool. And you're inside. And your screens are inside. So it's kind of nice in that regard. Any questions so far? All right. And it's air conditioned and cool, and he did mm -hmm. when you freeze him to death. Okay, who we are, I'll go through this. This is my lovely wife, Laura. RN, BSN, PHN, whatever that is, what's that? Something, public health nurse, and also a SANE nurse, sexually assault team. Uh, she's the co-founder. She's really the one that actually invented it, Richard, think of the concept. Uh, now she was raised in Cedarville, very incredible dark sky, beautiful place. And that's where she developed a love and admiration for the night sky because it's pitch black. In fact, it's one of the darkest places I've ever been. I thought Lassen was dark. I think Cedarville <laughs> is much darker and much better. Now, this is my friend Brent. Uh, I met him over the internet. He saw my article in Sky and Telescope and realized, God, I live 18 minutes away. He is a retired spy satellite systems engineer. He used to spy in Russia or whatever he did. Um, and he's also a very accomplished astrophotographer. Uh, and he's responsible for controlling the telescopes and also the cameras over the internet if we have a venue. So I do a little bit of the chatting. He does all the stuff behind the scenes. He doesn't like people very much. <laughs> he doesn't like to get out and mingle. So that's what he does, okay? All right. Um, He's not with us. No, no, he is. Mike is right here. Uh, Mike Ryan, you know Mike. You may not recognize him in this picture, but no, he, this is our wonderful beloved Mike Ryan, uh, former president of the San Mateo Astronomical Society, which he's been a member, I guess, over 58, 60 years, something like that. So he's been a while. He was there when I was there. He was a year ahead of me. We went to the same meetings, but I, I didn't know. So anyway. Then we hooked up. I can't remember exactly. We were trying to figure it out today, but whatever it was, I called him up, I think, and I needed somebody that could help me on my, uh, what do you call them, our star shows. And he was a planetarium person for a while. He did the planetarium, so he knew the night sky. He could talk a lot. 
and he was very knowledgeable. So I liked him because he could help me. I could do the telescope running and do some of it, but he'd be the main guy, show the nice guy, all that stuff, and talking to me about it all. That would keep me busy to try to fix what was going wrong with the telescope at the time or whatever. Okay. And he doesn't have white hair either. <laughs> I know, and I, this guy is me, but I have a lot more hair then than I do now. But it's uh, the only picture you gotta have that kind of resembles what I'd like to look like. Uh, so this is me a few years ago. Uh, so I, this is one thing I, I, I gotta tell you. I have no formal astronomy training whatsoever. Everything I've learned, I've picked up reading Sky and Telescope magazine since I was 10 or 11 and doing that. Um, in fact, my first, I, I retired after 37 years, I'm 72. My first class in astronomy was this year. <laughs> so <laughs> it's kind of fun to say I had some formal education now, but not much, like a few months. But anyway, I'm loving it. Um, I'm also an amateur astronomer and telescope maker, obviously. Uh, and I was the one that designed and built the Star Chasers Mobile and Permanent Observatories. So, um, and I operate and maintain the observatories. Now, my, I, I found these pictures. My mom recently passed at 96, but she had a big box of pictures and stuff. So I was trying to find some earlier days. So the nice thing was, is that I had a very difficult time when I graduated from the university to figure out what I was gonna do. Was I gonna go be a doctor or astronomer? So the thing was, is that this is me. Oh, oh, I went back, how do I do that? Okay, so in fourth grade, I read an article on something out of Look Magazine, a Life Magazine about how primates and chickens and all this stuff develop embryo, embryologically. And I was just super fascinated. Uh, so from that, I decided I was going to make, get an incubator and I was going to get fertilized eggs and I was going to incubate them. And then I was going to take them out in various stages and see how they all happened. And there's something in uh, biology, phylogeny or uh, ontogeny recapitulates biology. So it's really a cool concept and I loved it. Uh, so that was my medical kind of start. And then when I was a kid, I live in a college town. My mom and dad eh, had really no formal education, but I was fortunate to live in a college town and all these school kids and uh, would say, hey, I don't know, there's a library up the road. If you like the sky, which I did, come in, go to the library, I'd get your library card. So if you look here, that says, I think it says Jets and Rockets. My friend, that's an old book. And in fact, I, I, I'm trying to get it on Amazon. I think they still have that book. Uh, and that's my, my next door neighbor, Bobby Thurber, he's studying snakes. So early on, I was very interested in science, and this is how it's kind of started. Okay, now, this is a thing, this is a telescope that uh, changed my whole life in terms of astronomy. The next door neighbor had this telescope, no cameras on, I put all that, and it was made, uh, it was an eight inch telescope. He made the mirror at home, ground the mirror. Uh, he built the parts for World War II parts. And he had it in his backyard. And I went over, I looked over the fence, I said, oh my God, what the hell, oh, I love this. So I, he showed me, the, he showed me through the moon. He showed me the moon one night, the quarter moon. I was mesmerized. So I used to knock on his door almost every night and say, I wanna see that, I wanna look through the telescope. And he said, look, just take it, I'm kind of, I'm kind of sick of you, I think. So he gave me the telescope. So from there, I repainted it, refinished it, refurbished it. And I wanted to take a picture of the moon. <laughs> I, I know people did it then, but I, I wasn't really sure if they did. Um, but I remember they had Tri-X film. Any oldies up here that remember Tri-X film? Anyone remember that? Anyway, yeah, okay, good. So Tri-X film was it. And if you look at the camera, that's a bellows camera, right? Not a modern camera, right? Uh, so I went to the uh, local camera shop. I say, can I buy a camera? I don't know, I have $2, right? <laughs> so anyway, that's really all I had. So he said, look, kid, I have an older one. I use one in the back room. I'll let you have it. So what I did is he said, now you have to take it apart. You put a, a, a piece of frosted glass, get it focused. Then you take it out, put the, the film in there. 
careful so you don't expose it, then snap ditches and hope for the best. And most of them were hopes of the best. I got a few returned from whatever store or place I did. Uh, and then, so that was my astrophotography kind of stuff. So that was my first telescope. I think I was 12 years old or something there. And at 14, I built this first one. That was my first telescope two years later I built. Uh, now you might say, I didn't build this. this. No, I didn't. My brother was an engineering student and he built this crude drive, but it worked. It had a synchronous motor, a lot of periodic error, but he built it and it worked. So I incorporated it into that. That way I don't have, I, it would, you know, it would do, it would drive itself. And it was equatorial, all that stuff. And I also made it so I, this tube, it was a sonoboid cardboard tube I used uh, from some construction site. I put it on some rollers, put fiberglass on it, sanded it down a million times, painted it, put some end rings to make it look like the telescopes and magazines. And then there it was. So I had that for all. That was my little pride and joy. I even had setting circles here and there. So it was fun. And I could roll in my back deck. Uh, then I got, uh, then I, once I finished my residency in San Francisco, that was a long time. So in 1984, I graduated. I started my observatory in 1986. This was my first observatory in 86. Uh, so concrete, a lot of concrete and steel and whatever. So here I am a few years back. Uh, and this particular model I designed, I, I, I've never seen one like it, but my wife wouldn't let me uh, have too big of a footprint. So what the building did is this rotated. The building rotated around in circles. And also, I can show you another picture of it. So there it is, they're making it, blah, blah, blah. And that's, that's what it's done. So this is the light here. So what this thing, the whole building turned, 360 degrees, 180 this way, 180 that way. And that I hooked up, that little roof hole, uh, I hooked up to a actuator arm from a satellite dish. And I could yank it off, that way I'd have full view from the horizon all the way to the zenith, okay? Uh, that was my observatory for quite a while. Uh, and in it, at the time, I had a 20-inch Dobsonian uh, with a uh, equatorial platform. So it was really cool because it, it also was a equatorial mounted telescope, all in compression, but it fit into the observatory well, it was easy to move, easy to use, and it actually ran. And the interesting thing about the Stubsonian thing, <laughs> when I was at, in high school, I went to, when my brother started his training at, uh, as an engineer at City College. At City College, I met Mr. Dobson, and I don't know if any of you guys know him. He was a character, I think he was a monk or something. So he taught a telescope grinding, telescope making thing. So when I went to uh, Riverside, he was there very, you know, no fancy stuff, nothing. And I asked him where he was going to sleep because, you know, there's this monk walking around in a black robe, but I, I didn't want him not to have a place to sleep. He said, no, I sleep in the telescope too. So anyway, that's how humble he was. So he slept in the telescope too. All right, got to move along, right? All right, here we go. Okay, now this is, this is a setup at Lassen National Park. So this is kind of how the setup works. All right, here I am controlling the telescope. This is the screen, I think that's M51 we're looking at. There's the telescope, there's the camera. Now that's the F2 lens, that's the F2 reducer. The camera's on the top. So obviously we don't look through the back. It's all downloaded, like your telescope, the one, and it all comes up on the camera instantaneously, which is really cool. And what's nice about that particular thing, when you have a big crowd like at Lassen Park, when we, Mike and I went out there, you'd have two or 300 people and they could all sit down and look through it. Um, and what was kind of cool, and I'm a little prejudiced about this, because I've had ones you look through and I've had ones you do this and you move and you kick the telescope and you look through the focus, I hope that it's there. But often in a little bit of time, it's out of the field of view. And you don't see very much because it doesn't integrate and do all that cool stuff and present images. So those are instantaneous images. So we can go to image to image to image to image and maybe see 50 images in a night. Uh, and that was kind of a crowd pleaser. Now, the people that hated me in those things was the people that were really conscious about light, because that thing puts off a little bit of lumens, and so does that, not much, but enough to irritate other fellow astronomers that do eyepiece work. Uh, 
or photographic work with, with photography, not digital imaging. All right, so where are my maps? There we go. Okay, so there, uh, there's, here's another picture of the same thing. Uh, uh, Mike was there. He's asleep right now, but he's doing the talk. Uh, Lily's there pointing out satellites, including the, that shooting star, or whatever you want to call it. Uh, so we'd have quite a crowd, and that was the Dark Sky Festival at Lassen. Uh, Mike and I used to go up there quite often. There's Mike would be, have been right there to give a little PowerPoint or whatever, and I'd be over here like it was in the corner with the telescope. Uh, in fact, it's funny that we did this. Uh, this was taken by a professional photographer at Lassen with an infrared camera. And I think the last issue or two, or two of Sky and Telescope, which I think I've had since 1962 or something, uh, they had this in there because I guess they own the actual photograph because they took it with their infrared camera and they were talking about joining a telescope club and doing this. You can have fun doing talks and whatever. And that's, these, this is the one they used, actually. And I was happy that they did. I don't think they knew who it was or where it was, but they used that particular one. Um, so there's Laura and I, Star Chasers. Here's us uh, out in, in, at Lassen at one point, showing people during the day how it works and all that stuff. And, and that's where we would set up at night and have it all ready. I'm gonna go through a bunch of pictures. Now it's just a bunch of talk. So this is that little one, I developed that one. Because of this poor little kid, he couldn't get up to look at it and stuff, and he was crying and upset. <laughs> So I said, uh, I'm going to make this, Laura and I'm going to make this for people that have any handicaps or whatever. And the funny thing later, about six or eight months after I did it, I go back to the same location of the same R, was it? R park. What was it? It's an RV park. An RV park. And this kid showed up when I first brought it back and he gets to look through it again. So that's why he's there. And then he was a stoke that now he could, he was walking better, but <laughs> now we could see through it. So I felt good that I did it for people that couldn't get around so well. All right. Now, this actually occurred. Mike had me come up here many moons ago. I can't remember when. Uh, and I think that's a new planetarium, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I forget. That was relatively new. There was a real speaker giving a talk at that night. So I, I didn't get too many people that night. So he was giving, I think, the SETI group or something. Had all the people over there. And it wasn't well announced, but whatever. I brought it up here one night. And that's right in front of your new planetarium. So there you see it coming out, all the stuff that's on it. Um, and these are the other benefits of doing these kinds of things. I get to meet cool people. Uh, this is one of the astronauts. Uh, I met Story Musgrove uh, out there one time, who is the guy that repaired the Hubble Space Telescope, which is super cool. Um, and huh, five minutes, okay, you gotta go. All right, so now this is, this is here another thing. I think this might have been, what was Sequoia it? Sequoia National Park. Sequoia. So there's, Mike, his son, Michael, another buddy of mine. What's his name? I don't know, it doesn't matter. Um, Laura and me. So we're, we're just having a great time and meeting some fun people. Uh, and this is me with my favorite kinds of persons, a kid interested in this stuff. So I'm showing the telescope, he's loving on it and stuff, and he, he wants to be an astronomer and all that, so that's cool. Uh, so. And then we went to little schools, elementary schools and whatever, and we'd go there and do the same thing. So then the kids would say, thank you, Dr. and Laura and Assis, or whatever, and then they'd have pictures of what we showed them and whatever. They were very thankful, they, were, and they enjoyed it. It was fun, and I enjoyed it. And then we even went to some church groups and stuff, uh, and they wanted us to do a show. So here I am, and I forget which church this is. Uh, didn't matter whatever it was, uh, but we go, Pretty much anywhere that will invite us to go um, and, and that's really nice and this was a recent art show in Tehama County it was a Tehama County Art Institute year or, or their their show and it happened to be on astrophotography or astro art so they invited me to give my other thing so I brought a lot of my pictures there and it was fun. I met a lot of fun people, and it was fun because I get to show off a little bit of my astrophotography work. So that was kind of fun. Okay, then came COVID. <laughs> uh, I hate COVID. And it looks like there's some residual COVID people up there with their masks on, but that's okay. But it was a time where you couldn't gather very often 
in public because everyone was restricted. So uh, we're going to move on. Okay, and so because of COVID, we're unable to do in-person star parties. In response, I developed, we developed a high-speed, high-definition website. And you can go on this if you can. It's not updated at the last month or so. This meeting may not be in it, but I've been behind. Um, it's called starchasers.org. High-definition website, stream live video sessions taken through our own telescope, rows of <laughs> others over the internet, free of charge. So if someone has a telescope, wants to broadcast their images all over the world, uh, they go on my website, and I think it's S US OBS Studios. That's our platform, OBS Studios. And it's easy to get on, I think. And what you do is you just get on it, it's free. You don't need a password. I think it gives it one automatically or whatever it might. There's instructions. There's instructions. All right, so I want to keep going here. Now, this is my home observatory. I'm going to go through these really quickly. There's my home observatory. What do I have there? I, I, I built this Roloff Observatory, Roloff Roof Observatory. Uh, and like I said, I love building. I, I probably should have been an engineer, but eh, anyway. Uh, so I have a 20 inch there. I have a 14 inch Schmidt Cassegrain. F2, Hyperstar, all that stuff, fancy software, that thing. Oh, what did I go that wrong way? Uh, it has the, uh, that's a plane wave mount, plane wave arm, plane wave mount. Since then, I've modified it into an equatorial one. Uh, and maybe this is our live stream thing. So uh, these are observatories, and if you go to the live stream, it shows you how to uh, broadcast. Oh, next, let's go. Okay, since then I built additional observatories, both permanent and mobile, <clears throat> housing additional specialized telescopes for the purpose of photography, deep sky objects such as galaxies and nebulas. That's kind of my thing. I love that stuff. Um, uh, so here's a different view closer up. So what's cool about this, again, I live on the side of a hill. Eh, didn't want to take too big of a footprint because I already have another one out there. So I got to have that much and have to build it over the hill. So that's that. And what's nice about that, that can open and close in a minute. I'm out there running it, and then I'm done. I get tired, shut it off, pull it back, close the door, and we're done, which is really cool. And again, my buddy living five miles down the street, the spy satellite guy, has a direct microwave link to my place, and he can run all the telescopes. If I get tired, he can play with it himself and take pictures from his desk. Uh, here's another. Now, what I also do, because I'm getting a little older, I'm getting a little tired of a lot of running around, because it is a little bit of effort. So, what I do is I built a deck over here, and I bring guests over, and they can sit there, chat, and whatever, and then I can do a show for local people at the convenience of my house or home, whatever, and they can ask questions and do all this stuff. So, that's, that's, the, that's the latest thing. This is maybe a couple years old at the most. And that's the old one back there. You see that one back there? That's the other one, the original one. That's an 86 version. This is like a 2018, 19, 20, maybe. Oh. That's how it works. Deep holes, all concrete. Um, telescopes again. Now, th this, is a, this is a raw instant image off the screen. So this image is a screen image Bingo. Now that's taken of the actual screen of the TV screen. So that's not a photograph. That's just snapshot at night of the screen. So it comes up quickly, instantly. I can go from image to image to image very quickly. That would probably be a seven or eight second integration. It's integrated, it's stacked, it spits out an image. Now it improves. Like we were talking earlier to this gentleman, if you leave it on long enough, it starts getting rid of all the noise and this and that and the other. It just depends how long you want to wait. I'm not a very patient person, so I might want to see 30 or 40 images in the night. But if you leave it, it cleans itself up very beautifully. And if you do two or three minutes of um, curves, and what's the other word? There's another word we use. Uh, yeah. Levels. Levels. Does that someone say levels? Yeah. Yeah. You can make this thing beautiful within a few minutes. Uh, and I'll show you kind of. So this is just bingo on the screen. There it is. Uh, there's another bingo one, all right? 
Now, a little cruddy, a little whatever. Most of it is in that it's not tracking well. It's just a little pixelated and it's a little cruddy looking because it's a raw image and it hasn't had time to clean up itself. Right. And I'm showing that just because, yeah, I was, I'm showing, yeah. This is a raw image of a star cluster. It's a nebula. You see the colors now? Um, now this is, this, is, this is how it really works. So let's say I get this image like this and I work on it for five or six minutes doing curves and levels. I go from this to this on the screen. So it's nice because if you spend a little bit of time, it comes out well. Now, big star shows, we want to see a lot of images and stuff. I go through a bunch of them because I want to see this one or that one or whatever. And then when everyone goes home and tired, the real people stay back and there's a handful of them. And then we go through playing with the real tweaking because most people, oh, they're done. All right. Now, recently, because of, and my, I have, this is out of my 14 inch telescope at home. And this is before I had a narrow band filter. The images were getting a little crappy and I didn't like it. So I went hunted all over the place, asked people that knew what they were doing and said, oh yeah, you gotta get a narrow band filter, blah, 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 blah. Now that's true, the only problem is about a thousand bucks each, but it makes it so much better. So I can go from a kind of a lousy image to, I think this is a nice image, would people agree? Sure. Pretty good image, right? And the other thing is those colors are the colors you see, and which is really nice. So there's no adding color to this or whatever. That's the picture I got. Uh, and the other one I was really impressed with I took recently, yeah, I've taken this one. This was the veil. Uh, this is with a different camera, not as good, not as good of a camera, but not a bad picture. Do I have the North American Nebula in here, maybe? Anyway, there it is. That was taken in my backyard <laughs> with kind of a crappy sky. I mean, not nearly as bad as here, but in comparative to the way it used to be in Lassen or whatever. Uh, so that's the North American. And you see how big the field is? And that's the color. I mean, so I love it. All right. uh, the horse head. And again, the field of view is enormous, right? You can see everything. Everyone knows these are. I'm just going to buzz through these. So these are kind of images on the run, cleaned up with a few minutes of putzing on the, with the software. Uh, uh, galaxy or star cluster. Pretty clear, pretty point, pretty pinpoint, pretty nice, fast. Uh, we know these. Horse head, that's my favorite. That's my favorite one. Um, uh, I love this one. This is another one, dark one. Now, I forget what this search like. This, I don't know what year it is. It's, not, it's a long time ago. So when I first took it to, oh, we get more, all right, so I'm gonna go. So these are some articles that are written about it when it first came out. Uh, it's all pretty much different now, but it was pretty cool at the time. People loved it. This was uh, a, a, one of my pictures, and this was when they had the uh, art show. Art show. Um, and then the Cedarville, we were, Laura was from Cedarville. And she took me to the dark sky one day. I said, that's probably why I married it. It was so beautiful. So, but it was so gorgeous. The sky was so great uh, that we went back and we stayed. There's a park that is bubbling hot springs and whatever the sky is jet black. All right, so this is just recently. I think it was it August, so we just were, were up there. Um, so there's the article that, that actually did a great article in the paper. Um, uh, that was one when I was fiddling, just to show you can make mistakes and do stuff. So at that time, I didn't realize, eh, I had the wrong filter in there. See how terrible that color is? Oh, anyway. So, eh, uh, it's a mistake. I learned how to fix it, but anyway, it's all about trial and error. Um, and then, I think that's it, right? Mm -hmm. That's it. All right, we're good. So how do you shut it up? Okay. All right, I want to take questions if I could. Um, how do you shut this off? Okay, good. I have one. Please. What narrow band filter are you using? Which narrow band filter? Yeah. You know, I have a few of them. I think it's called a Tri something, TRI something. It's in, I bought it through OPT. Okay. And, and I, I, I have it written down, but I don't remember because I have a few of them. But that's a, that filter is awesome.
awesome filter. I just, I hold it like this, like a crucible because I'm afraid I'll drop it. Uh, but it's very nice. Oh, the other thing I want to tell you, just one thing, one question. You know that Hyperstar lens? Okay. Uh, the guy that developed it, Dean Koenig in Star Arizona in Arizona, he asked me to test it because I was doing around this mobile observatory craft and I used it and stuff a lot. And he said, would you test this thing for me? I said, sure, why not? Why not? It goes from F10 to F2, no one else had one. So I had the original prototype. And I felt pretty cool. And then he sold thousands of them, right? But the cool thing about it is that they have that 10 inch or 10 inch Celestron with Hyperstar on the International Space Station. I thought that was pretty cool. Hmm. And in fact, he went to entertain the president in a star party at the White House. That was pretty cool. Other questions? Yes. So I'm thinking about a pure white light galaxy image, like the Sombrero Nebula. Yeah. Uh, like the Sombrero Galaxy, for example, with an appropriate light pollution filter, like what's worked for you. Yeah. Is the key to bringing out contrast in that image, just at least a few seconds of integration and stacking. That's that all it is. That time. That's all it is. Seconds. And you don't the levels and all that other work is makes it nicer, but that's not the foundation necessarily. It isn't the foundation. I can tell you why it's so it's so easy to do. I can do it there if I can take have two or three minutes to mess with it. Now, I'm not as good as my friend, the guy that sits at the computer 24-7, because that's all he does. He never goes out. So, but he can do it immediately. I might take a few minutes, but within a few minutes, you can go from pretty crappy image, comparatively speaking, to that one I showed you with the, the blue and all that stuff. Oh, yeah. yeah, so yes, it is. It's very simple, and the software they have is incredible. And it's, <laughs> it's amazing because you got to remember I've been doing this since Sputnik right and the imagery and, and, and what's really really amazing to me is that it's cool that I lived at a time as a kid of the space age so to speak I saw Sputnik, Mutnik, all the people go up in space blah 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 so in the curve the, the equipment and, and the knowledge and the technology to go from taking a picture through a, uh, a Tri-X film to what we have now, and the, and the computing that you can use with it. So what I try to do for kids is I try to tell them, there's no limits here, man. I mean, you, with the technology you have, you can almost do anything if you use technology properly, obviously. So what's really cool is that his, I think we were talking about his telescope. What's the name of the telescope? Yeah, with the EV scope. EV scope, stuff. right? He has an EV scope. I think it's 2,000 bucks. But the thing oh. of what it can do oh. for, 4,000, sorry. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that was a discount. <laughs> so what you can do with something like that for 4,000 bucks, it would have cost 20, 30,000, really. Now it's a small mirror, but still, it's awesome. I'm very yeah. impressed with what he has. There's about a dozen in the club right now. Yeah. Oh, they're really popular. <laughs> very, and I can see why. I can see why. I, I'd like to make a bigger mirror and do one, but eh, I kind of do in a way. More questions, please. But since you travel a lot to the still, do you have to worry about collimation? No. Uh, well, not really. It's amazing. You know, it's really kind of amazing you say that, because that thing bounces around everywhere I go. And I've never recollimated it. <laughs> now, you know, now the only thing is about having said that, the one in my permanent observatories, those where I do more critical work, those are precisely collimated. But to get great images, real time, uh, you can do great work. Because most people can't see, unless you're an astrophotographer, you go, oh, gee, that's a little bit out of frame here down here. You know, no one's going to say that. So again, the audience is the lay people in particular, and they just want to see something cool and fun, and they love it. And then the more people get a little snoppy with me or whatever, I said, oh, come to my home observatory, and I'll show you some better images. And those are pinpoint, because it's collimated perfectly. Other questions? You mentioned Lassen a couple of times. Yeah. Is there a particular spot at Lassen you like to go to? Yes. I tell you what, there's two great spots. 
uh, hell, whatever hell. hell. What is it? Bumpus Hell. Bumpus Hill. Bumpus Hill. Bumpus Hill. I think it's actually yeah. Bumpus Hill. Bumpus Hill. Yeah. That's Bumpus right Hill. at the top. Beautiful. Milky a little Way's glow. Huh? Milky Way from there. Oh my God, it's awesome. However, I like the visitor center, the Kuka Luka Huka, whatever that <laughs> visitor center is. And I like that because there's food and drink in the bathroom. You get older, you need a bathroom. The South Visitor Center. The South Visitor Center. So that's my favorite spot because I don't need a perfectly dark sky because the telescope does the work for me. Now up there in the mountain, if you don't have uh, all the equipment and stuff, you got to have a little better sky. So I can kind of compensate it and kind of cheat a little bit with that stuff because it's I have an advantage. Norm? Yeah. I might just add that uh, the Bumpus Hill parking lot, yeah. which is where the uh, Nevada Astronomical Society sets up, yeah. uh, our sky festivals, is about the 9,000 foot level. Boom! Mm -hmm. And the Cone Yamani uh, Visitor oh. Center down at the south end of the Yeah. That's about 6,000. Yeah, so it, it's up there. It's up there. Yeah, it's up there. there. But I'm telling you something interesting, though. I, I don't know the phenomenon of why, but I've been to that place many, many times. But. The place the world is, what's it called again? Cedarville. Cedarville? Oh, Cedarville. Also in black. It's There's um, pitch the black. Massacre Rim yeah. Dark Sky Sanctuary. Yeah. That's um, like 20 miles away. It's the darkest, I mean, it's one of the darkest. One of the darkest in the United in States. In the whole country. So it's, 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 it's really incredible. cool. It's incredible. So again, I'm interested because the one I'm, I'm, I'm taking this one observatory to this Los Molinos, this uh, Dye Creek Observatory, pitch black. And what's nice about it is pitch black is I can, I could utilize it from my satellite thing and pretend that it's in my backyard. And it's 20 minutes away. And you're going to be doing star parties. Yeah. And we're going to be star parties starting next month. And we're going to bring it down there. And, and then we're going to get more online stuff. I've been just so busy trying to retire and go to school, you know, like take astronomy. <laughs> I haven't devoted as much time. Well, anyway, I want to thank you, everyone, for staying awake, most of you. And uh, it was very nice. I'm glad I came back. It was special because this is the first time really back since 1968. Okay. I remember the old observatory, right? The old one that was here? Planetarium. Huh? Planetarium. I'm sorry, the planetarium. And the interesting thing, I'll just tell you a real quick quickie. I liked astronomy then. I liked medicine. I didn't know what I was going to do. But anyway, long story short, when I had an English class in the summertime, um, it was you had to take a, you had to do a paper in English and then make a, oh, it's interesting, fun, a Super 8 video documentary thing. And mine was on UFOs. So it started off in the old, we call it planetarium. And then we ran out as scientists in our white coats. And so underneath the old library, or the new li the library, and underneath that they had the TV stations. And we were calling aliens and they were coming down. It was, it was a blast. <laughs> But it's interesting to see that whole thing is gone. The projector is in there. And this is beautiful. Yeah. It's cool to come back. What a memory. What a what a what an awesome, what a beautiful campus. The place is gorgeous. Anyway, thank you very much again. If you have any questions, I can I'd be happy to chat with you. Okay?